Hi, greetings from New Jersey Institute of Technology. My name is Mike Small and I'm Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office at NJIT and I'd like to welcome you to the first Highlander chat of 2020. Uh, first and foremost, I want to offer my best wishes, the best wishes of the Alumni Association uh, and of New Jersey Institute of Technology to all those who are watching uh, and to your families. Uh, we wish the best for a safe and healthy spring. So the point of today's Highlander chat is to talk about coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, the road ahead. Uh, with that in mind, what I'd like to do is introduce the Dean of our College of Science and Liberal Arts, uh, Dr. Kevin Belfield, to talk a little bit about his college and some of the research that's being done there. Okay, Kevin, I think I've got you up. Great. Thank you, Michael. As Michael said, I'm Kevin Belfield, Dean of the College of Science and Liberal Arts at NGIT and Professor of Chemistry. The College of Science and Liberal Arts, or CSLA, began in 1982 to provide foundational science, mathematics, liberal arts, and social science education to all NGIT students through our general education curriculum and over time through our department's many degree programs. In addition to six academic departments, CSLA also hosts an Air Force Reserve Officers Training Corps detachment and the theater operations. The Department of History offers BA degrees in history and in law, technology, and culture, NGIT's pre-law program. Bachelor degrees in the Department of Humanities include Communication and Media, Theater Arts and Technology, Science, Technology and Society, and the BS in Cyber Psychology, an exciting new program that is first of its kind in the US. We also offer a fully online MS degree in Professional and Technical Communications. The Department of Mathematical Sciences offers BS and PhD degrees in Mathematical Sciences with a number of concentrations including mathematical finance and actuarial science, which by the way, is ranked number five in the country. The department also offers several MS degree programs. The Department of Physics offers BS, MS, and PhD degrees in applied physics and the BS in biophysics. The department is also home to the Center for Solar Terrestrial Research with world-renowned scientists and facilities in space weather sciences. The Department of Chemistry and Environmental Science offers BS, MS, and PhD degrees in both chemistry and environmental science, the BS in biochemistry, and an exciting new program just launched this year, the BS in Forensic Science, New Jersey's first undergraduate program in forensic science. We also offer the MS in Pharmaceutical Chemistry and the timely new Professional Science Master's program in Cell and Gene Therapy Sciences. While NGIT has been offering degrees in biology since 1997, the Department of Biological Sciences was founded in 2007 and moved into its current home in the renovated Central King Building, the former Central High School in 2014. With 14 faculty members, the department serves over 360 biology majors, as well as MS and PhD students. Research in the department spans a range of subjects from neurobiology through physiology, behavior, and anatomy, all the way to ecology and conservation biology. Now, let me introduce the chair of the Biological Sciences Department, Dr. Gareth Russell. Dr. Russell is an associate professor of biology and an ecologist with a particular interest in how complex ecological systems work and in information-based statistics and ecology. Dr. Russell will tell you a bit more about himself and something about the current situation we all face, the coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Russell. Hello everyone. Um, as the Dean said, uh, my name is Gareth Russell and I am an ecologist. Now, you might be wondering why an ecologist would be speaking to you about a medical emergency. And the answer is simple. Infectious disease is ecology. For many decades, epidemiological modeling advanced only slowly until two Oxford-based zoologists, Roy Anderson and Robert May, realized that their own work in ecological modeling was applicable to infectious disease and more advanced than what was happening in the medical professions. In 1992, the year I graduated from the same department of zoology, they published Infectious Diseases of Humans, Dynamics and Control, which quickly became the Bible of epidemiology. For my own part, every fall I teach an undergraduate honors course called Ecology and Evolution of Disease. An alternative title might be Biological Foundations of Public Health. Most of the students that take it are heading to medical or dental school, 
And it is a sad truth that, until recently at least, most medical schools did not teach evolutionary concepts, even though many diseases have evolutionary explanations, or, as in the case of antibiotic resistance, direct evolutionary causes. So, my main goal is to instill an appreciation for evolutionary and ecological thinking in my students before they head on to the next phase of their careers. My subversive goal is to try to tempt some of them into careers in public health, the need for which has never been more apparent. One former student who saw the light is currently in Delhi working for UNICEF on sanitation campaigns and reporting to me from inside the lockdown. But back to the matter at hand, you probably know as much about the COVID-19 coronavirus at this point as I do, or indeed anyone does, which is not much. It is related to viruses that cause the common cold. It jumped to humans from other mammals, probably from a bat species or pangolins. It's not clear yet. There are literally dozens of coronavirus variants circulating in bats, rats, and other mammals. It's an extremely common virus type. A friend on Facebook, it was not the result of deliberate manipulation. It is not a bioweapon. But there are a huge number of unanswered questions, such as how it transmits so effectively prior to respiratory symptoms, and most interesting to me, whether it is evolving and in what direction. You probably know that case fatality rates seem to be different from place to place, although exact numbers are impossible to get because of the confounding factor of testing variation. But in my class, we talk a lot about the evolution of virulence, which is how sick a pathogen makes its host, the patient, and how pathogens that can evolve quickly, like viruses, adapt their virulence to benefit themselves. When a disease jumps to humans from a different animal host, the initial virulence is a roll of the dice. Another recent zoonotic disease, Ebola, is famously virulent, to the extent that the first few outbreaks failed to spread, in part because patients would sicken and die so quickly. But from the most recent Ebola outbreak, there is evidence that virulence was beginning to decline, suggesting pathogen evolution. This is good news for individuals who contract the disease, of course, but bad news from a public health standpoint. And indeed, recent Ebola outbreaks have been spreading further and further. The coronavirus, by contrast, has relatively low virulence, with many individuals being almost symptom-free, but for that exact reason is very difficult to monitor and control. And unfortunately, when contact diseases are in environments where contact, and therefore disease transmission, is frequent, they tend to become more virulent. This means that social distancing isn't just about limiting spread, but about limiting virulence as well. There's a huge amount to do to untangle all this, which we will only get to once the initial health crisis is over. And I'd like to end by putting the current crisis in a larger context. Last fall, I could have used the coronavirus as an example in my class, if we had known about it. It was, we now know, circulating in Wuhan province at the beginning of December. Instead, we did what we usually do. We watched an, instead a Nova video from 2005 that refused what were then relatively recent emerging diseases such as SARS and avian flu. The end of that video consists of a string of prominent scientists saying, somewhat desperately, that zoonotic diseases will continue to emerge, that some of them will have the potential to unleash global pandemics, and that we need to be prepared, from setting up international monitoring efforts, to preemptively developing vaccines, to stockpiling medical equipment. These calls from the medical and scientific establishment have been loud and constant and largely ignored. An international monitoring scheme was set up, led by the US, but it was allowed to fade away in the last couple of years. And there has been precious little in the way of pandemic preparation. So, official word did not get out of China until the end of December. Prior to that, there was confusion followed by information suppression. That delay cost China dearly. After that, with just one exception, each country, each city that the virus jumped to, including our own, reacted too slowly, waiting for the number of patients expressing symptoms to rise before taking significant action. The truth is that we have the scientific understanding and the technology to detect and suppress outbreaks quickly and to treat patients effectively. But deploying that technology at speed and at scale is a political and an economic challenge rather than a scientific one. And I'm afraid it is one that we have badly failed at. Likewise, as we're seeing now, the consequences are also both medical and economic, which makes it entirely appropriate that we are next going to hear from our colleagues in the Martin Tuckman School of Management. Anyway, 
Thanks for listening to me and please stay safe. Dr. Russell, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I wanted to pitch a couple questions to you that we received from alumni, faculty, and staff online in preparation for our recording today. Uh, the first, and one of the ones that I know uh, strikes a lot of us, is how does the transmission rate here compare to previous outbreaks like SARS, MERS, uh, Ebola, some of those? Well, um, first I want to make it clear that we won't know the answer to this for a while because the data that we need will be retrospectively collected and corrected for things like the variation in testing rates. Um, so it's going to be a little while, unfortunately. The other thing to know is that the rate, which is encapsulated in what epidemiologists call R0, is dependent not just on the disease itself, but also on the host, and especially on the behavior of the host, that is, people. R0 can be thought of as the average number of people infected by a single person with the disease in a population in which most people do not yet have it. So if R0 is greater than one, the disease will spread. And if it's less than one, it will fade away. So we have a little bit of time before COVID-19. I was gonna say for COVID-19 before social distancing precautions, it seems preliminarily that R0 is between two and three, but it might be higher we'll know when anti antibody tests are developed that can tell us retroactively who had the disease, even if they weren't tested at the time. Now for comparison, SARS had an R0 also of about three, but it was much easier to detect. MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, illustrates the point about context. In the general population, it has low human to human R0 of about 0.6. Most human infection chains were short and start with reinfections directly from animals. But in some hospital situations, when workers did not know what they were dealing with, the R0 was much higher. So speaking of testing, there are so many people out there who, uh, according to everything we've heard, very likely have coronavirus or have had coronavirus, but don't mm -hmm. know. Um, so with that in mind, is there a point in time at which you think people will be able to go to a hospital, get a regular blood test, and there might be some biomarker uh, that says, hey, look, you've got antibodies, you had it at one point? Yes, I mean, this is beyond my area of expertise, um, given that I'm not a doctor, but I am sure that that is going to happen, and I know people are working on it right now. Um, and as I mentioned before, the existence of such a test is actually will be crucial to understanding the true dynamics of the pandemic, because we will have to go back retroactively to figure out who had it and when in order to understand um, the nature of the spread. So I'm sure that is coming and we absolutely do need it. So uh, one of the other questions that came up from multiple people was this notion of inoculation uh, versus mm -hmm. treatment. So uh, as we know, uh, coming up with some sort of vaccine that you can take to ward this off is, is similar in some sense to how we're currently starting to treat the flu or we have uh, most recently. But if you look at some other uh, viruses that are out there, we just say, look, you've got to get over it take some cold pills, go home, try to cover up, keep safe. Um, do you have a sense based on the historicity of this virus um, of which way we might go in terms of that sort of treatment or inoculation? Again, and I, and I hate to keep saying this, but we just don't know. And the reason is that we don't know the evolutionary dynamics yet because it takes some time to figure those out. As you pointed out, the seasonal flu constantly evolves meaning that the vaccine is only partially effective and temporary. And for the same reason, having had the flu doesn't prevent you from getting it again for the next year. Now, COVID-19 might be like that, but it's sufficiently different in structure from flu viruses that we shouldn't rule out the possibility of some kind of universal vaccine. Um, so let's hope for that. But again, it's going to be a while before we know. All right. Dr. Russell, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, my best wishes to you and your family for a safe and healthy spring. My pleasure. Stay safe, everybody. Okay, so we heard from Dr. Kevin Belfield, Dean of the College of Sciences and Liberal Arts, and Dr. Gareth Russell uh, in the Department of Biology. Uh, now, what we're going to do is chat a little bit with the Dean of the Martin Tuckman School of Management, Dr. Oya Tukel, uh, as well as some of the faculty from her division. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Tukel to the interview today. Uh, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon, Mike. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this webinar. It's very um, uh, difficult time for all of us, but at the same time, it is an opportunity for universities, especially 
NJIT research focused universities to be able to um, try to understand the unknown territory that we're all in right now. We're learning fast. I have to emphasize the role the universities play in our society uh, with the cutting edge technology, uh, the research that we do that might not have an immediate you know interest by the population but then many times we are the ones making the difference as Garrett was mentioning you know a lot of research going on in universities might eventually uh, make the the markets in the society so I'm part of NJIT we are a business school but we are unique in the sense that we put a um, business context around technology. Everything that we do and teach has a touch of technology that businesses use and students uh, immensely benefit from what we do. We have recently started a, a business data science program. It's a PhD program. It's very popular. And we have faculty who are uh, amazingly good advisors to our students. And many of the research we do involves me, uh, big data, mega data. Um, we uh, work with data from healthcare and we use data to better understand the markets. And I'm very happy that we're part of this discussion. Um, and I have a great colleague and a well-known person in my region, Dr. Michael Ehrlich, uh, who is going to be talking to us about what he did, thinks is going on in the marketplace. Um, he worked in um, uh, uh, he worked in Wall Street. Uh, he had his own business. He analyzed market data, um, and he joined um, early 2000 to uh, uh, Martin Tuckman School of Business, uh, and his. Um, um, interest is more in uh, institutions, especially focusing on early stage companies. Uh, he's an amazing instructor teaching innovation, entrepreneurship and commercialization. Um, and he studies market failures. Uh, he has been an associate editor for the Journal of Corporate Accounting and Finance. Um, he always promotes the cross-pollination of scholarly research with practitioner cases. We learn a lot from him, even me being here only a year, uh, in terms of how realistic we need to be with the research we do, and we wanted to see the impact of the research uh, in the marketplace. So um, Dr. Ehrlich also founded and co-directs the New Jersey Innovation Acceleration Center, helping small businesses. And he was awarded an SF iCorp site grant to support the commercialization of technology. Um, so he has uh, many more uh, awards and uh, numerous uh, titles. Um, but he's also very influential with our research institute, Layer Research Institute. He and another faculty, they're um, um, constantly, you know, uh, sending out manuscripts that relates to the financial bubble research. Uh, Dr. Ehrlich received his doctorate from Princeton University in economics and his bachelor's degree is from Yale University. So I'm looking forward to hearing his um, uh, input into the webinar and uh, I'll be happy to um, uh, answer any questions that might help about my uh, school and the research we do. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Ehrlich. I'm an associate professor of finance in the uh, Martin Tuckman School of Management. Um, <clears throat> my Principal research, research areas, financial markets and institutions. Um, and I particularly focus in the area known as financial market failures. And so that makes, makes uh, this ex current experience um, something that I'm really interested in and it follows up on research I've done before. Um, and so I'm gonna share with you um, a few um, ideas and, and, and uh, insights. And of course, uh, point out some of the things we don't know and we're gonna all learn as time passes. First, 
I'm going to start and end with just a little bit of advice. Uh, the first bit of advice comes from the immortal words of Douglas Adams, don't panic. These are very challenging, troubling times for anybody who's thinking about the financial markets. If you are uh, looking at your retirement account or recently retired, these are, these are times that are going to make you nervous. And so the main thing I'm going to say is don't panic and we'll come with some, uh, I'll finish with some, some concrete suggestions. But let's talk about COVID-19 and what do we think is going on in the economy uh, with COVID-19? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to separate sort of the direct versus the indirect effects. The direct effects um, are, are costs, if you will, uh, so far are relatively modest, actually, at least compared to a typical flu year. Um, in a typical flu year, we'll see between 20,000 to 50,000 uh, Americans die. Um, and we are not actually anywhere near those numbers for COVID-19 yet. And we don't talk about the flu every year as being having a major financial impact. Um, and so at, at this point, the direct effects of COVID-19, the, the, the people who are uh, dying or leaving the workforce uh, or, uh, uh, is, is still actually relatively modest. The key here is, of course, um, uh, the indirect effects. And the indirect effects really are the behavioral changes that we're all making. Uh, that are driving costs now, um, and the, and those and those may be very rational, um, and it depends upon not what's happened in the past, but what what we expect to happen in the future. And so, one of the keys about um, a pandemic is that it's very important to try to get ahead of it. Now, uh, Dr. Russell pointed out that we've probably already lost that battle, and we've probably already lost the ability to get ahead of it and to really control the disease at, at the outset. Um, and that was not because of technical lack of technical house, really lack of uh, political ability to respond quickly in a, a liberal democracy like we have in the United States. Um, so, so the question is, what are those expectations? Well, so what are some of those indirect behavioral changes? Well, the indirect behavioral changes are that we're, we're well, in New York and New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, lots of parts in the United States, we're currently uh, sheltering in place. We are uh, staying home from work. Uh, some of us are able to work online very effectively, um, but some of us are not. And so that rep represents a significant reduction in the workforce, significant reduction in GDP, and we're going to see uh, significant economic effects. Just to be clear, uh, there is really no question that we're going to have a recession. We're probably in one already. It's very likely that the economic data, when we actually eventually see it, will show that we have a minor downturn in GDP in this first quarter uh, in uh, of 2020 and is going to have a major downturn in GDP in the uh, second quarter. So what are the expectations that are driving these markets? Well, uh, as people kind of update their future expectations, we're seeing the markets go up and down, and we're seeing very, very choppy markets. Um, this is a very difficult time to trade. Uh, I spent uh, about 15 years on Wall Street as a securities trader. Uh, and what I would say is you want to get positioned right and then just kind of hold on because it's very hard to kind of get in or out of positions in these kinds of these kinds of times. And generally, um, what I, uh, you know, again, as a trader, you would you, you would advise less trading than more trading just because it's going to be very expensive and you're going to be looking for uh, specific opportunities. So one of the things that we're seeing is that is that we're seeing that if a bunch of businesses are going to be closing down, certainly uh, we're looking at a lot of the, a lot of the businesses, the hospitality, retail, et cetera, um, that's going to lead to unemployment. That's going to be lower lead to lower consumption. That lower consumption is going to lead to lower earnings, and those lower earnings are going to feed out as lower dividends uh, eventually in these in these stocks. Now, how low and for how long? And that is the million dollar question. Because it could be that this is going to be a blip and a relatively short amount of time. It could be this is going to be kind of a medium amount of time. And there could be, in fact, really a long-term uh, shift in the economy. And right now, uh, we don't really have good answers to those questions. Part of the problem, of course, is that we've never seen anything like this for over 100 years. right? The, 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 uh, so uncertainty is going to be super high right now. Um, the last time we saw a global pandemic that was even somewhat analogous was the Spanish flu, and that was 1918, right? So more than 100 years ago. Um, we've seen other downturns. We'll talk about some of the experiences from those other downturns. But overall, we're experiencing very volatile markets. And they're volatile because, again, people don't know what to expect. And they keep getting updates. And they keep getting actually somewhat contradictory information. So again, something of a political failing is that we have not had 
really robust, consistent messaging from uh, political leaders across the spectrum um, that has, I think, hurt our ability to kind of unify around a message and respond uh, quickly. And so we've seen good news and bad news and the market's kind of going bouncing up and down. And so we've seen uh, several days when the when the uh, Dow Jones has gone up or down 2000 points, which is really remarkable uh, movement in the in, in the index. Um, and so and, and, and of course, we've seen the market in general go down. And so the market has actually fallen more rapidly than we've seen really any time in recent history. Uh, and, that, and that includes actually the Great Depression and uh, and the most recent Great Recession. So the market is down uh, about 30% right now. Uh, it's been down as much as about 35%. Um, and so we've seen the market bouncing around um, a lot, but in general going down quite sharply. One of the reasons, of course, is that when you're talking about expectations, uh, you're talking about expectations of human life. And the risk of death kind of defies rational pricing. And so it's very hard for people to really think rationally about this because, in fact, if it's, if it's you, uh, you know, basically that, that, that uh, pricing is not something that economists can actually speak to in a particularly coherent way. The second major thing that we're going to see is supply chain disruption. We've already seen it to some degree. We've seen it for goods that are um, uh, really in high demand. And so we've seen it for uh, masks. Um, and uh, we're, we've seen it for goods that are, where they don't maintain very large inventories, like toilet paper. Um, and we're going to see it in a lot more goods, though, because, in fact, uh, China is the factory of the world. And, with, and, and uh, China manufactures some enormous amount of what we. Uh, consume. And even if the if suppliers that we're buying from are external to China, they often are very, very often using China inputs. So even if you have a drug manufacturer based in the United States or Europe, uh, they may be using uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients that they actually get from China, for example. So we're going to start to see follow on shortages of many, many things. Um, those iPhones, you know, if they're disrupting the production, you may find it takes a longer time to get some of those things. Uh, already, we're actually seeing that uh, um, shipping has actually slowed. And so we've seen uh, Amazon actually delay and, and deprioritize what they regard as non-urgent uh, shipping items. And, um, and we're going to continue to see that. So we've seen uh, ocean freight drop precipitously. We've seen um, air freight, uh, of course, airline traffic has dropped precipitously. Um, and that all reflects kind of this... Uh, shut down in production in China, and it's going to take time for them to get that production ramped up again. In the short run, of course, we haven't really seen some of these disruptions because uh, companies maintain a backlog inventory. Those inventories have pretty much been worn down, and so um, as they try to restock and re, re, uh, re uh, build their inventories, uh, we're going to find the shortages of, of lots of goods that we take for granted. Now, the other thing is that, of course, that we've been directed to shelter in place. Now, shelter in place uh, basically means, for me, it means work from home. For many of us, that's going to be the case. Uh, but not everyone can work from home. If you're in the travel industry, the tourism industry, the entertainment, restaurant, hospitality, retail, brick and mortar retail, cruise lines, the gig economy, temp, temp workers, none of them are, are well positioned to work from home. And so we're going to see uh, a spike in unemployment that is going to be quite shocking. Um, even during the Great Recession, unemployment really never got above about 10%. 10% is a very high rate, but, um, but, it never, but that meant that 90% of people were able to continue working. I expect, actually, there's a good chance we're going to set a new record in modern unemployment uh, from, uh, that, that uh, is higher than we've seen since the Great Depression. And so we're likely to test that 10% level and even exceed it um, just because uh, those workers that I mentioned from, you know, travel tourism, entertainment, restaurant, hospitality, retail, et cetera, a gig economy are, um, it's a large part of our economy. And so between the interconnectedness of our economy and the large reliance on these, on these sectors, uh, the economic effects are going to be uh, very sharp. And of course, that very that understanding of very sharp expectations uh, de decline in the economy has actually been what led, is what led to the very sharp decline of the markets. Okay, so what are we seeing in the markets uh, in general? So in general, we're seeing what's known as a flight to quality. So the increasing uncertainty that we're experiencing across the markets is leading people 
to want to reduce their portfolio risk. Now, your portfolio risk is made up of lots of things. Uh, you may have uh, money in an IRA. You might have money in the stock market directly. You might have uh, money in uh, uh, bonds or money market funds, uh, mutual funds, uh, ETFs, uh, real estate uh, for your home, uh, plus your own human capital. So you're going to have money in lots of different uh, places. But as uh, the risk goes up, you're going to want to reduce that risk. And one of the few places you can reduce it relatively quickly are in the liquid public markets for uh, uh, securities. And so we're, we're already observing uh, U.S. investors are selling foreign securities and buying domestic securities, something close to home. They're selling stocks and buying, sorry, buying U.S. treasuries. Uh, they're selling bonds and holding cash. And so all of those things are happening in um, already in the markets, and we're seeing we're seeing um, very choppy markets. Uh, I would say that one of the most troubling things from my perspective is just how choppy these markets are. We are uh, not seeing uh, orderly markets where people kind of trade in a kind of a calm way. It's kind of more like panic trading, and that panic trading is. Um, Sorry, that planet panic trading is showing up in uh, rapid falls in, uh, in in the markets, but it's also showing in like high volatility for things like yields on ten-year treasury bonds. Normally, the yield on the ten-year treasury bond does not bounce up and down; it drifts up and down with inflation and kind of Federal Reserve action expectations. But it's not it's not it's not something that uh, um, uh, bounces up and down. But we've seen the rate go from almost two percent down to below. Uh, half a percent, back up to over a percent and back down. I don't even know where it is right now, but it's really moved in an unprecedented degree. And that kind of talks about the fact that people are panicked. People are moving very quickly. Uh, the, the market depth, that is the dealer market depth, is shallow relative to the size of the markets, which is uh, me, means that big investors who get panicked can push the market around quite a lot. Now, Warren Buffett had a famous quote, um, and I'm going to try to get it right, but it's only when the tide goes out that you can tell who's been swimming naked. Now, what he's referring to is that when the stock market goes, when the stock market's high and everybody's feeling comfortable, then a lot of a lot of activities we do are not really very economic and doesn't really matter because everybody's feeling very comfortable. As the stock market goes down and basically we start to see uh, the other tide goes out, um, kind of the rocks start to appear uh, literally when the tide goes out. And so we've already seen the first of those. Uh, we actually had already and are having an oil price war. Uh, we uncovered that because uh, with the drop in the uh, stock market, uh, many countries, um, there was a drop in demand uh, from China for, for oil. That caused the price to start to go down. Uh, OPEC was unable to sustain it. Uh, there was basically a fight between Russia and Saudi Arabia, uh, also kind of related to the U.S. shale, shale oil frackers. And um, oil prices have dropped uh, lower than they've been for uh, decades. So you might ask, what's next? Um, and I don't have a crystal ball. And we don't know. But you can certainly look at some places where there's points of concern. Um, one point of concern is that there's extreme leverage in the market. There's more debt, corporate debt out there than there's been for a very long time. And not only is there more corporate debt, but there's more corporate debt that's kind of lower grade, that's triple B, uh, which is considered investment grade, but you know, again, the lowest of investment grade and even, even below that. Um, if you look particularly at the private equity firms, uh, they have extremely high leverage. Their leverage might be six to one uh, debt to equity. Um, and so um, so that's that means that as operating revenues decline for some of those companies, we are at risk of seeing defaults. Um, what that means for uh, liquidity and for mutual funds is unclear. Now, the good news is the Federal Reserve has been responding super aggressively. They have uh, basically guaranteed to li provide liquidity to the market. Uh, they provide liquidity to all the markets that all the fixed income markets trying to forestall defaults and maintain liquidity in the markets, maintain liquidity for the brokers and the dealers. Um, and so uh, they've, they've committed to buying commercial paper. Recently, they committed to uh, buying even corporate bonds, even triple B corporate bonds, which is unprecedented and new action by the Fed. We're going to continue to see that um, as there's as the Fed is attempting to respond to these surprises and changes. Okay, as promised, I'm going to end with a little bit of personal financial advice. 
hopefully you already have a financial advisor and a financial plan. If you don't have a financial advisor, you need to find one. And the financial advisor you should find should be somebody known as a fiduciary. Um, you may have a broker and brokers are good um, and they can give you good ideas and they can help you execute trades, but brokers make, the money, make their money by selling stuff and buying stuff. And so they might direct you things to the things that have the highest commissions or payouts for them. You should ask, a fidu ask your advisor if they're a fiduciary. You should make sure your advisor is a fiduciary. That means you're probably going to pay them a fee, but it means that they're working for your behalf. They are, they are legally obligated as a fiduciary to work on your behalf. Now, that means they're going to help you put together uh, a good plan and a good portfolio, and a good advisor is going to help you put together a plan that is going to incorporate the fact that these financial downturns happen. They happen on a regular basis. We haven't seen one for about a decade, but generally every five to 10 years, we can expect to see historically that there's going to be uh, a market downturn. Uh, there have been 12 of them since uh, 1945, since World War II. And so, so this experience is not so unusual and you should, you should basically um, be prepared for it. And then if you have a portfolio and you're prepared for it, what you want to do, and it's very hard, is put your hands on your chair and just kind of do nothing and, um, and recognize that this too shall pass. Um, when you get your quarterly statement from your retirement account, uh, my advice is it's going to give you bad news. I advise you not to even open it. Just take it unopened and stick it in your drawer uh, for later for tax time and reconciliation and whatnot. But uh, for right now, my advice is, again, ending where I started, don't panic and kind of um, if you have, if you, as long as you have a good financial plan, just stick with it. All right. Well, really best of luck. These are challenging, troubling times. So please stay safe and be well. Dr. Ehrlich, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, real quick, and I, I know you mentioned a little bit about the fed, um, just out of curiosity, when we talk about the fed investing in the economy, and if you covered this, I apologize, but um, that that idea of negative interest rates. So, you know, this is something where there's quite a few countries around the world who have done this previously uh, to this to to the pandemic um, being out there. Is this something you think we're likely to do in the country? I know President Trump has talked about it. Uh, the Federal Reserve has brought it up a couple times. So, so negative interest rates could be a thing in our future, um, but in general, the Federal Reserve doesn't like negative interest rates. And none of the central banks do. And the reason that they don't is, is really um, a function of the fact that if interest rates get to be too high, they know how to make interest rates go down. They can basically take money out of the economy, make raise interest rates, and, and, and slow down the economy, which causes interest rates to ultimately – inflation to go away and interest rates to go down. We saw that in, uh, in, in the, the early 80s uh, where the Fed uh, ad ad adapted to and adjusted and caused interest rates to go down. When interest rates are very low, it's harder for the Fed to make them go up. And so if they go negative, uh, the Fed doesn't have a lot of tools to make interest rates go up. Um, because uh, so, so if they go negative, they don't you – know, they, 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 and, and, and you have price deflation, which is prices go down instead of going up, um, then it's hard for, the, hard for the, the Fed to adjust the economy. So they would rather – so their optimal level of inflation is actually a positive level of inflation of about 2%. That's what their target is. They want inflation. Um, they've been disappointed that they haven't had as much inflation as they wanted. So I'm not telling you there's not going to be negative interest rates, but I'm going to tell you the Federal Reserve is going to resist having negative interest rates the best possible. They'd much rather cause inflation, modest amount. Okay. Dr. Ehrlich, thank you so much. I just want to bring on uh, some of our other guests uh, here, uh, Dr. Russell, uh, Dr. Belfield, Dr. Tukel. Thank you so much for joining us today for the uh, Highlander chat, uh, the first Highlander chat of 2020. Uh, we really appreciate your time, and I hope we're going to do this again soon. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. Sure. Yeah, Thank pleasure. you, Mike. Thank you, and, and good luck to everyone. Yeah, same here. Thanks. Okay, everyone. So that was COVID-19, The Road Ahead. 
uh, with the deans of the College of Science and Liberal Arts, Kevin Belfield, the dean of the Martin Tuckman School of Management, OA2 Kell, uh, Dr. Gareth Russell from the College of Science and Liberal Arts, and uh, Dr. Michael Ehrlich from the Martin Tuckman School of Management. Uh, again, thanks to all of them for joining us. Now, I'd like to encourage everyone uh, viewing this video to please leave some comments in whatever medium you happen to be looking at it on, uh, including YouTube, LinkedIn, our Facebook page, or anywhere else where it's promoted. Um, we'd love to uh, solicit your comments and forward them on to our faculty and our deans, uh, and hopefully you'll be joining us for the next one as well. So again, in conclusion, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, again, from New Jersey Institute of Technology and the Alumni Association of NJIT, our very best wishes for a safe and healthy spring. Thanks again.